Hi, I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and welcome to six easy behavioral interventions for anxiety. Simple things your clients can do to reduce anxiety quickly. So anxiety, like water, takes many forms. So water can just be water. But that same H2O can manifest as steam or as ice. It can be life-saving for a person who's dehydrated or fatal for, for a person who's lost at sea. But what of anxiety? Anxiety too takes many forms. It might raise its head as crushing panic. It might manifest as the sickening flashbacks of post-traumatic stress disorder. Then again, it might hang around like an unwelcome house guest as generalized anxiety or trip us up as a baffling yet powerful phobia. Depression too is often fueled by unresolved anxieties. See reference one and two below the video. And certainly anxiety seems to be at the root of obsessive compulsive disorder and of at least some people's descent into addiction or compulsion as self-medication. So yes, anxiety is a many-headed hydra. In this piece though, I want to focus specifically on discrete episodes of heightened anxiety. And I'll give you some really useful behavioral tips to help your clients minimize and control specific bursts of anxiety, such as panic attacks. So how can we best help our anxious clients? The multi-pronged approach to treating anxiety. So it goes without saying that anxious clients need to learn to relax deeply and often. Relaxation is the antidote to fear and stress. And yes, we can help clients challenge many of the catastrophic all or nothing thoughts produced by high anxiety. But here I want to give you some really simple behavioral alterations that can help your anxious clients immediately. Our behavior is so often a reflection of what we feel and think, but because we exist in feedback loops, what we do also influences how we feel and think. So there are many things we can do to help people overcome anxiety, or at least align it so that it's only there when it needs to be, to motivate us to fight or flee during an actual physical threat. So here we'll focus on some behavioral interventions. So what do I mean by a feedback loop when it comes to human anxiety? The mysterious power of chewing gum. Okay, so years ago, someone from across the ocean sent me a peculiar question that really got me thinking about the feedback loop of emotional instincts. So why is it, they wanted to know, that when chewing gum, they felt calmer in situations that would usually send them into a spiral of panic. And I thought about that and I thought, well, fear, of course, is a survival instinct. So we need it to help protect us from physical threats. So you don't cure anxiety, you help align it so that it behaves itself and works for you only when it really, really needs to. So our instincts, at least in part, are blind. You know, they take their lead, so to speak, partly from what you do and what you experience. To a degree, we train our instincts the way we might train a pet or guard dog. Anything we do that sends the message to the fear instinct that we're not currently facing a present and immediate threat will cause the fear instinct to back down because your instincts don't want to waste energy. Fear is a big investment of energy and our bodies know that we need to conserve energy and not waste it. So our answer for the friend who sent the chewing gum question becomes clearer. One of the first things to switch off when your flight or fight mode response kicks in is salivation because you don't need to be eating if you're trying not to be eaten. Okay, so people get dry, a dry mouth when they're panicking. If you're in a tricky situation and you chew gum, the gum makes you salivate. This salivation feeds back to your fear instinct that all must be well, and so all the other symptoms of fear get reduced as well in a kind of domino effect. By chewing gum in a usually stressful situation, our friend was sending the message to his instinctual mind that this is so unthreatening that I can afford to chew and salivate, therefore it can't be a threatening situation. Any behavior that contradicts the fear narrative, whether it's salivating, talking, acting normally, or staying instead of running, 
will start calming things down pretty quickly. So let's look at what behaviors we can encourage in our anxious clients to help them tame their anxiety response. Tip number one, name the anxiety. A 2015 study found that putting feelings into words can reduce physiologic symptoms of anxiety. See reference three below. And in fact, the study found that the more words people used to describe their anxiety, the more their symptoms of anxiety reduced. And this is really interesting and something we can communicate to our clients. We can also tell our clients that subjects in the research study um, didn't expect that putting their anxiety into words would reduce their anxiety. So it wasn't really suggestibility, but physiological testing showed that it reduced all the same. Yeah, it's really interesting, I think. What's more, the reduction in anxiety occurred regardless of whether the labels people used for their anxiety were spoken or written down. So we might ask our clients to write down in a notebook in some detail the way, they are, the way they're feeling when they become anxious. Okay. And just doing that seems to greatly reduce the anxiety itself. We can encourage them to use as many extreme, even exaggerated fear words as possible with the assurance that this can help dilute the actual anxiety. We human beings have an innate need to express ourselves. So putting experience into words can dilute its impact uh, as we have to use the left prefrontal lobe in the brain to verbalize um, what we're experiencing. And since anxiety is essentially an emotion expressed through the right hemisphere of the brain, this activation of the less left hemisphere can reduce the experience of anxiety. This may be the way that it works. But in order to show their instincts there's nothing to fear, our clients need to do something else as well. Okay. So tip two, face the anxiety. In nature we avoid what might be deadly. But in a more complex world, what we avoid starts to feel threatening because we're avoiding it, even if it's most certainly not threatening. To live a life of avoidance is to live a life of fear, or no life at all, a diminished life. If you want to convince your fear instinct that something is dangerous, it's simple. Just avoid it or flee it when you come across it, and then the fear can build even more. If you happen to panic, for example, in a particular store, and then run from that store, as far as, far as your fear instinct is concerned, there's something deadly in that store and it will stop you even wanting to go back in there in future. Now, simply because you ran away from the store, it might feel overwhelming or terrifying even to ever go back into that store. Had you stayed in the store until you calmed down, the instinctive conditioning might well have been different. If nothing had happened in the store and you uh, regained a sense of calm while you were still in the store, then the fear instinct would have had no cause to tag that store as a deadly threat. Okay. If you stay in a situation rather than run from it, then eventually fear switches off because if the situation was really life-threatening, you'd run away or you'd be killed you know, in, in the situation. So you train your instincts partly by how you behave, what you go toward, what you go away from. Run away and the fear builds, stay and the fear diminishes and it works the other way around too. You know, people who make themselves go towards um, certain situations calmly and repeatedly doing something that is life-threatening are communicating to the fear instinct that what they're doing isn't potentially deadly when it might be. You know, so if you think about the old-time lion tamers uh, putting their heads in lion's mouths, those fearless souls shooting themselves from the mouths of cannons or people repeatedly, repeatedly doing base jumping, okay, because they're voluntarily going towards these experiences, the fear response gets the fake message perhaps, these experiences aren't threatening and the person becomes less anxious when they're doing that. So we can describe this to our clients and suggest that although fear is, is uh, their vital survival drive, we can help them tame it so, so that they're, they become the real boss of it, so to speak. And of course, staying in a situation when you're panicking or going towards a situation you're frightened of is much easier said than done. But we can help our clients do this by firstly explaining why it's necessary to go towards what we fear, not away from it, teaching them the other feedback alteration strategies in this piece that I'll be talking about, helping them visit the feared situation or place in their mind whilst they're relaxed and calm. So as far as the fear instinct is concerned, to imagine a feared place or time whilst feeling calm is to actually experience it for real and they can re-tag that as non-threatening. 
If your client does start to panic, they can instantly employ the next strategy. So tip three, breathe out the anxiety. So your body, everybody's body, seeks balance or homeostasis. It's positively looking for a reason to calm down again. Okay, your body is looking for signs that it should be calm. Fear is essentially the exercise response. You know, if you're breathing hard, sweating, gasping, and after a time shaking with exertion while on, on the treadmill or the rowing machine in the gym, we don't call that a panic attack, we call it the exercise response. But if your breaths are shallow, your, your brow is sweaty, and your heart's racing when you're, say, sitting down during a meeting, this we don't call the exercise response, we call it a panic or panic attack. So actually the second example is effectively the body preparing for exercise. The symptoms of panic are so close to the symptoms of heavy exercise for a reason, because panic wants you to act in purely physical ways. Okay. Once you've got past the freeze response, then you become physical. No one is attacked by panic, which is why I don't like the disempowering metaphor of panic attacks. And I, I don't tend to use that metaphor with my clients. Rather, I often talk to my clients in terms of an unnecessary or inappropriate exercise response. Okay, we need to tame that exercise response. And again, anything we do to let our instincts know that this is not actually a situation that requires a massive investment of our energy, we don't need to exercise within this situation, we'll tend to balance out the feelings of anxiety pretty quickly. So every breath you take is important. Now, one of the first responses to shift when we tag something as threatening is our breathing. We need to pump around more oxygen for all that heavy exercise our survival requires. So what panickers or inappropriate exercise responders tend to do is to gulp air. This is also what we do during heavy exercise because our muscles need extra oxygen to power them to do heavy exercise. When we breathe, in, we activate the sympathetic nervous system, the part that has to do with fight or flight, heavy exercise and arousal. But when we breathe out, we activate the parasympathetic nervous system, the part that relaxes and calms us. People will often sigh, slowly breathe out, when they're stressed as their body seeks to balance out their arousal levels and calm them down, looking for homeostasis. We can teach our clients 7-11 breathing, which they can do as soon as they feel at all anxious. And this method involves breathing in to the quick count of seven, not seven seconds, but just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. Pausing for a moment, then breathing out to the quick count of 11, pausing for a moment, and then repeating. So the numbers don't matter so much. It could be, you know, uh, out to the seven and into five. The important thing here is that the out breath is slower and longer than the in breath. And this technique has a ripple effect. Uh, there are benefits beyond just directly and quickly calming the person. You know, so other ripple effects of breathing in that way, that the focus on breathing is a distraction. The fear response, if it could think, might conclude, I wouldn't be focusing on my breathing if there was really an immediate threat, you know, if there was a lion in the room, okay? We can teach our clients to use 7-11 breathing or 5-9 breathing while they imagine whatever it is they feel afraid of, their trigger. So in this way, we start to change the physiological response associated with that trigger. We can do this via the imagination. But even before they focus on their exhalations, we can ask our client to do something that will help them start to stand aside from the anxiety. So tip four, grade the anxiety. Okay. So years ago, I was, I was just about to present to 150 people, and I'd never presented to more than, say, 20 or 30 people before that time. And suddenly, just before walking up on stage to speak, I started to feel much more anxious than, than was useful for the situation. And I thought, well, I'm not having this, you know. So I decided to grade the anxiety on a scale from 0 to 10, 0 being no anxiety at all, which would be just plain silly before giving a big talk, and 10 being the most terror that I could possibly experience. And I decided I was at a 6, which is way too high. And already I'd done a few things to dilute the anxiety. I'd reframed it from uh, a feeling to a number. Okay, Thinking about numbers is not nearly as scary as thinking about fear. So this diluted the fear and also forced me to use the cognitive or thinking centers of my brain, which so often become locked out or hijacked by fear. I'd also put a limit on it, you know, rather than letting the fear escalate to terror, I'd given the fear an upper limit. I'd also taken back a sense of control. I'd gone into a mindful 
observing self-state. A part of me was outside of the anxiety watching it. I was not in the anxiety now, I was watching it. I'm watching what number it was. I then picked a number I'd be happy starting my talk at. And I decided a three would be fine. You know, I could start a talk at three. That's, you know, got an, a, enough vitality there. I began to breathe out slowly and for longer than I breathed in. See tip two. Then you know, when I'd breathed myself down to a three, I walked on stage and began to talk. And this took perhaps 20 or 30 seconds. As none of the audience tried to kill me, you know, <laughs> amazingly enough, or even screamed or yelled in my direction, amazing, my fear and sync soon got the message this wasn't in fact a deadly encounter, this wasn't a deadly tribe, you know, uh, the natives were friendly. I began to relax, get into a flow and even enjoy the experience. So our clients can get into the habit of grading anxiety in the moment, then choosing a number they'd be happy with, okay, then they can breathe their way down to that number. And this may seem like a really simple intervention, but it can be incredibly effective. The vast majority of panickers uh, can be helped through clinical hypnotic strategies and or these behavioral strategies as well. So for some, however, discharging the energy might be the way forward. So tip five, discharge the anxiety. Apart from being a powerful antidepressant, um, hard exercise is a way of switching off panic. When we, for example, sprint or perform push-ups or squats to the point that we can't do any more, we have in effect completed the fight or flight response circuit, the, the cycle of the fight or flight. A 2011 study found that people with high anxiety sensitivity, as they put it, an intense fear of the nausea, racing heart, dizziness and stomach aches and shortness of breath that accompany panic, reacted with less anxiety to a panic inducing stressor if they're being engaging in high levels of physical activity before that. So see reference five. So exercising more intensely, more often, will tend to lower anxiety generally because people are you know, fulfilling the, the, the circuit. People who exercise regularly tend to be healthier mentally and less anxious than sedentary types anyway. Okay. But sometimes we can prescribe some kind of exercise to do even as anxiety rises in the moment. And I was inspired by a case study of Dr. Milton Erickson in which he helped a TV presenter overcome panic just before he presented live by prescribing star jumps prior to going on air, uh, with time to get his breath back, of course. Okay. In a similar case, a, a woman who felt unduly anxious before making a presentation at work was asked to do, um, out of sight of her audience, 50 star jumps as fast as she could. Okay. She found that once she'd got her breath back, she was ready to talk and felt weirdly calm, in her words. So her body had gone through the whole cycle of intense exercise and it now felt like she had survived an emergency and she couldn't help but feel calmer. <clears throat> she felt like a victor now, not a victim. And of course, all the usual sensible checks into health need to apply here when prescribing exercise. So if we exercise intensely to the point that we can't exercise anymore, then as far as our instincts know, we've gone into the fight or flight response and because we're alive at the end of it, we have survived the threat. As I said just now, we are the victim, not the victim. And it can be really hard then to panic. So it's, it's making panic harder uh, to do. It's as though that some people need to complete the arousal circuit of fight or flight through exercise. Okay? And this kind of intervention certainly doesn't have to be as dramatic as the examples above, you know, simply doing 20 star jumps or as many push-ups as you can manage, even if it's not quite one, will help de-potentiate panic or inappropriate exercise response. And that can be effective even some hours before the feared situation. It's like if your body remembers that and feels pretty good, you know, the endorphins have kicked in, the dopamine is, is there. Okay, lastly, we can encourage our clients to be aware. So tip six, teach your clients the aware technique. So I sometimes give anxious clients a little card they can get out and use as a prompt whenever they start to find themselves feeling panicky. So aware, of course, is an acronym. And the A stands for accept that you're feeling anxious and also name it. See tip one as well that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, watch the anxiety and even grade it. Act normal, breathe as described in tip three, and carry on acting as though there were absolutely no threat. If you talk, breathe calmly and stay in the situation, you're showing your fear instinct. It doesn't need to tag this situation as threatening and things will calm down. R stands for repeat the previous three steps if necessary. 
E stands for expect the best. You're taking control of the fear instinct and taming and training it. You can see that focusing on these steps by reading them from a small card if necessary incorporates many of the principles of the tips that I've just been talking about. So in summary, to reduce anxiety quickly and effectively, teach your clients to number one, understand how the fear instinct is led in part by what we do. We can train this powerful guard dog. Avoidance will build fear while staying or approaching the fear situation will diminish fear. Remember this approach can be done psychologically during deep relaxation to quickly retag the situation as non-threatening. Two, name the feeling either out loud if appropriate okay, or internally or by writing it down, explaining that this has been shown to lessen anxiety even in people who didn't believe it would work for them. Three, breathe out longer and more slowly than they breathe in. This will quickly turn off anxiety, which requires that we breathe in rapidly in preparation for heavy exercise. So again, we're showing the instinct that it doesn't need to be there. Four, grade their anxiety, then decide what number they would be happy with in this situation. And it, it probably wouldn't be a naught, wouldn't be completely relaxed, you know, and breathe their way down to that level. Five, utilize regular exercise as a way of minimizing stress and anxiety. You could even have them uh, do short intense bursts of exercise before a stressful event if it's practical to do so. And six, use the aware technique and carry a card with the steps if need be. Anxiety is there as an occasional power to be utilized in the hopefully few times it might really be necessary in a physical situation. To return to my water analogy, we can learn to swim or even surf the waves of adaptive stress, not sink into an abyss of fear. Just as we can use and harness water, we can use the alternating currents of stress and relaxation to build satisfying and meaningful lives. So I hope you found that useful, and if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching.